Okay, so we'll talk about the first step in about the first steps in seeing, and we'll talk a little bit about cortex today. So as I said, most of um, what we'll be talking about in this class, although the, the theme is the neurobiology of consciousness, most of what we'll talk about will be the neurobiology of conscious vision and unconscious vision. For a number of reasons, a we um, we are highly visual creatures. If you get a cold. You know, you don't smell, but it really doesn't, I mean, it's somewhat annoying, but it really doesn't really interfere too much with your daily life. Well, let's say if you go mountaineering and you become snowblind for two days, you know, you're devastated, right? What you can do is severely curtailed. So we are, and, you know, between 30 and 40 percent of our brains, 30, 35 percent of our brains are, are given over to vision and the analysis of visual images, the visual information coming in through the eyes. It's a significant fraction of our brains dedicated to vision. And there are many visual illusions, and you can manipulate these um, uh, visual images very easily. And we know a lot about vision in, in animals. And we just know so much less about some of the other modalities. And some, some of them are much more difficult to, um, to manipulate, have a slower time scale, etc. So that's why we're just opportune and, and focusing on vision. And the, 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 one of the basic lessons of today's lecture is that you don't see with your eyes. What I mean to say with that is that um, although you need your eyes to, to normal vision, not for every vision, right? You, I can close my eyes, I can still do imagery, and I can still dream, all of which without my retina, you know, and, but for, for normal vision, I need my eyes, but my eyes is not where, um, it's not where visual consciousness occurs. The, the activities, the state of the, of the various neurons in the retina do not reflect accurately, do not reflect the way I see the world the way I as subject perceive the world. So uh, although it's terrible important, as we'll see, it's the first steps, perception happens in higher stages, which is, what I, which is what I express by saying you don't see with your eyes. Okay, so this is the stuff which, which you see. So this is a, a, a transmission a microscope, a EM picture of a retina. It's a retina of a closely related species, rabbits. I mean, closely related as as, as biology goes, um, it, it's um, it's not much different in a human retina. It's going to be a little bit thicker than so a human retina. It's probably like 150 micrometer or something. Think of it like a credit card. It's a little bit thinner than a credit card, and it's on the order I don't know of um, you know something like this: five square, five to eight square centimeters. If you take the entire entire bless you the entire retina. Now the curious feature of this is. One very curious feature um, is that the light comes from below. So, what you have in the in the retina. Okay, these are the so-called cones and rods. So these are the photoreceptors where you have a transduction of the photo of the photons, the um, the um, the light signal, the electromagnetic signal is converted at this stage into electrical signal. Right. So this is where physics meets biology, as it were. Now, this is at the back of your retina. What you have here, well, we can quickly move forward. This is the human eye. This is a typical vertebrate eye. This is the lens. So the, the image passes through here, then, for, well, the, um, the, the waves form here and form a sharp image, usually sharp, unless you wear contacts or glasses, at the back of the, of the eye here in the retina. So this is the retina we're talking about, just shin feet of, um, of neurons. Highly, highly, it's a beautiful piece of neural engineering. And the picture we show, be, um, before showed a zoom up, zoom in of that. And the, first, the, um, the image, the photons have to go through all of this stuff before they strike the photoreceptors at the back of the retina. So the photoreceptors are at the back here. So it's really backward. So the light has to uh, transverse all these different neural stages, which for the most part are translucent to, the, uh, to, the, um, um, uh, to these wavelengths, until it gets absorbed, the odd photon becomes absorbed here, in the photoreceptor gives rise to an um, electrochemical signal, so very complicated um, uh, uh, set of uh, biochemical reaction that ultimately leads to a change in memory and potential. A lot, of known is, uh, a lot of known is about it. This continues to be an area of research, but the, uh, at the gross level, it's, re it's reasonably well understood how light is transduced into electrical signals. And then it has to percolate through all these different neuronal cell types till it ends here at the ganglion cells. These are ganglion cells. So the ganglion cells 
provide, they have axons, so these are spiking neurons, they generate this action potential I was mentioning, and they generate, they have an axon, and a million of these guys bundle up together, you can see a, a little bit of it, and leaves the retina. So the output, so what's nice about the retina, it's a fairly simple, it's, it's, it's a laminar structure that is both uh, horizontal as well as vertical connectivity, and you, you, the input is well defined, it's light, of a certain, I mean, very limited uh, spectral bandwidth, and the output is also very well defined as action potential at the at these wires here that collectively are called the optic nerve. You have between one and 1.2 million uh, of these axons that make up the optic nerve, and if any of you have ever dissected a, an animal in a, in a prep course, you'll, you can easily see the output, you know, it's this little stalk that comes out of the, the eye. That stalk is, of course, that includes the myelin sheet that then insulates and some other fiber that insulates the entire the entire uh, assemblage of wires, but essentially you have 1.2 million wires coming out of each eye. Now you have all these, con these different neurons, they're called uh, amacrine cells and bipolar cells and horizontal cells, and they're very different cell types, but we're not going to go um, into that. What is important is, okay, this shows several very important facts. So first of all, you probably all know there are two, there are two broad classes of photoreceptors. There are two broad classes of photoreceptors. One are called the cones, cones, photoreceptors, and the other one are called the rod photoreceptors. And they're related, and they use similar bio, um, uh, biophysical mechanism to signal, but they have different sen sensitivity. The, the, uh, the, um, the uh, um, photoisomeric substance, the substance that allows you to convert the incoming photon into ultimately electrical signal, has a slightly different spectral sensitivity. So you have these very small uh, 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 photoreceptors called rods. You have roughly 100 million of them, between 195 and 105, 110 million. So the, the, uh, the predominant cell type in your retina are these rods. And they um, have this distribution. This is at the center. At the center of your vision, the fovea, the point of sharpest seeing, the one you usually use if you try to really look at something, there are almost no rods there. And then the, the it peaks at, um, it has two peaks, a bimodal distribution to the left and to the right of the fovea. Here's an, another odd uh, uh, feature of, of the eye. I'll talk about it in a second, called the blind spot. So they actually, there's a location in the eye at which you have no photoreceptors whatsoever. There's literally a hole there. The hole is necessary because that's where the optic nerve has to leave the eye. So that location, you have a blind spot, you have no photoreceptors. So that location, in principle, there should be a hole. There ought to be a hole. Now you can see if I have two eyes, the input from the other eye can compensate that. But it's a little bit strange to explain why, if there is a hole, why don't I see the hole? If I take a CCD camera and remove you know, some of the pixels, it'll be, even if you remove a single pixel, it's incredibly annoying, and you'll send it back. You, know, you, you want to get a refund because the single pixel is always black, always white. So why don't we have that? Well, it turns out there's a very clever mechanism that the brain uses to compensate for that. And so it's interesting, historically, the blind spot wasn't discovered until sometimes in the 16th century in France, I believe, which is a quite remarkable fact. Come to think of it, it's, it's present in our eyes and, you know, we talk about it, you can detect it, but it really wasn't known, at least historically, it wasn't known until a few hundred years ago. So then you have the second photoreceptor type called the cones. They are between roughly 5 million, so 100 million rods, 5 million cones, this is in each eye. And they peak at the center, the point of sharpest seeing, the fovea, they peak, and then they rapidly die out such that at roughly 10 degrees, 15 degrees eccentricity, you just have very few of those. And collectively, I'll talk about they mediate color vision. There are actually three types, three subtypes that are called, that should be called short, um, uh, sh short wavelength sensitive photoreceptor, medium long uh, wavelength sens sensitive photoreceptor, and long wave wavelength sensitive receptor, or S, L, and M type. But everybody calls them, sort of as an abuse de langage, calls them red, green, and blue photoreceptors. Um, but I'll tell you what, that's really not the right way of talking about it, since one of these photoreceptors isn't really selective to blue, it's, it's selective to the entire spectrum. So you have, so you have this, uh, this is very different from a CCD or a CMOS camera where you have a homogeneous coverage, right? If you ever look at, a, if you manufacture them or you look at a CCD or CMOS camera, you'll see constant hexagonal grid everywhere. Here, although you also have hexagonal spacing, certainly in the fovea, you have this very irregular pattern. You have this, this um, and this is a unique characteristics of, of retinas. Um, it doesn't have to be like that, but animals 
all animals have some sort of specialization that you have this very high density that rapidly falls off. The reason for that is believed to be that you only have, at the point of high seeing, takes a lot of special resources. You need a very extreme high density of neurons there, and that for various reasons that was too expensive to maintain everywhere. So instead, it apparently it was cheaper from evolutionary point of view to have this uneven retina where you sample a lot of information at one point, namely your, your point of sharper seeing, and then you have you have this uh, you have the complicated structure that enable you to move your eye rapidly around. That seemed to be right. You can do you could do it like a CTD camera. That's in principle you could have a retina that has a constant density everywhere and that doesn't move. But for, for, for whatever reason, animals didn't choose to pursue that. Now, not everybody has this phobia. Some animals, for, some grazers have what's called, um, what's it called? Um, they have an elongated phobia, a, a, a visual streak. They have a visual streak. So their phobia isn't point line, <coughs> it's elongated. <coughs> it makes sense if you're a grazer, like a you know, cow or something, you really want to be, you know, you have to worry, or a gazelle, you have to worry about predators. So you really want to have point as sharp as seeing all, all of here. Or some animals, I think some birds have two phobias. So it's, uh, this tends to be something that um, uh, all primates have. Also cats and other animals have. Um, um, mice, I think, also have. Okay, so you have this, uh, the point of sharpest seeing at the phobia. So the phobia, um, just to give you an order of magnitude, so this is like a degree or degree and a half. Right, if you roughly you know, compute this distance, this distance, take the tangents and radians, you see at least my, I did it for my thumb, it's like a degree and a half. So your, your point of sharpest seeing usually is, is, is like a degree and a half or even less a degree. That's really the point of sharpest seeing. And that's where you have this concentration. So within a, you know, within a few thumbs outside of this, it falls off at least the density is redu reduced by at least a factor of 10. Does that distribution look the same in all directions? So the vertical as well? Let me come to that. To first order, to first rough order, yes. Now, you'll see actually a, a real retina looks much more messy, but there's no large-scale uh, asymmetry. There are various fine-scale asymmetries between up and lower visual field, but to a first extent, it's radial symmetric. So this is really just a point of very, I mean, really only the central vision. That's why you constantly need to move your eyes, certainly if you want to read. It's very difficult reading things outside your, outside your, 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 in your fovea. So, um, and this mediates color. So, a so, so, number of things. So, as I said already, this doesn't accord with our perceptual experience. We have no hole in our, ret in our perception, although we have one in the retina. This also says, this distribution tells us that the cone photoreceptors, which mediate color, sort of peter out very rapidly, but it's not that outside here there's no color, right? It's not that I only see here color and everything else here is grayscale. The world doesn't look like that, right? I can look at this and clearly that light source there sort of is, is, blu is bluish. So um, again, it's, it seems to be, so you can argue that if you look at all these mechanisms that perception is this wonderful con job, it, it suggests, you know, these, it suggests that everything, it's it colorful, there's high detail and fidelity information everywhere, and where in fact, this high fidelity information is only present at certain locations, particularly at the, um, at the fovea. Now these photoreceptors, these are, these are the cones, they work relatively rapid. They have a time constant of you know, tens to 100 milliseconds, while the rods, these ones, work much slower. Now, rods have, there's a trade-off there. Um, the, the cones work faster. There are three subtypes, so you can get differential uh, spectral sensitivity. But they also uh, take higher, uh, they, don't, they don't respond as well to individual photon. Their threshold for responding is considerably higher in terms of, you know, if you just vary the light intensity and you measure when you get a significant electrical signal, their threshold is considerably higher than the threshold of, of rods. It's been shown already 50 years ago that if you put a person in dark and adapt them, okay, for 20 minutes in total dark, and then you, then you release... Um, um, uh, uh, photons from a very weak light source, where you can actually, based on statistical arguments, that there are individual photons that are being re um, that are being released. The uh, dark adapted retina can pick this up with more than uh, with more than chance probability. So, in other words, your system is so sensitive that it's ultimately limited by physics. The entire system, the entire retina, can pick up statistically um, individual photons. That really means you're limited ultimately by physics. And that seems to be a general lesson in, in, in the nervous system, that all these sensors uh, are limited really by the physics of, of, of what is possible. Now, of course, you could, for example, you know, what you could do, you could lower your temperature, you know, go to liquid nitrogen, but that's clearly not a solution that, that, that's sort of easy to adopt for, 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 for biological organism. So the, the argument is, given the existing neural hardware, the neural hardware does as well as it possibly can given the physics. 
Now, um, where, I mean, when, when would you likely, I mean, based on what I said just right now, when is it likely you would see the, the rod receptors? When, when do you think they are needed in normal life? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, not total darkness, but, but um, you know, if we turn off the light here and we only have these faint room lights, or maybe one or two of those uh, room lights, then, uh, then you would use these, uh, these rods. Certainly at, at um, you know, when it, at a starlight. Uh, moonlight, probably it's already pretty bright, but certainly starlight, um, you know, that's when you would use uh, these receptors. So it's, it's a little bit, it's, I've never seen a clean explanation. I mean, you have 100 million of them, but you only use them um, you know, for a limited amount of time. Of course, you could argue it's critical during that point that you have this uh, low light vision system. So think of it like a low light vision system. Certainly under this light, the, uh, the rods are totally saturated and you couldn't use that. We know that also from, there's, um, there are people who are called achromats, chroma color A, absence, achromats. So these are unfortunate souls who are born without any cone receptors whatsoever. Their, their eyes has no cone receptors whatsoever. And, um, Oliver Sacks, you know, the neurologist, he wrote a book about him, The Island of the Colorblind. What turned out there was, um, that's in the Marshall Islands in the, in the South Pacific, and there was a king who had a harem, and way back in the 17th century, most of the island got wiped out by a typhoon, except the king and his harem, and the king turned out to be an achromat, so he passed on through his harem, he passed on his genes for, for, for achromatting. Today, like 25% of the population, at least when Oliver Sacks visited, 25% of the population descended from a king and, and, and has um, are achromats. So they have to wear either two sunglasses or very, very, very heavy sunglasses, and they're only comfortable really at night. Because otherwise they just see, I mean here they wouldn't see anything else, it would just be all bright. Um, and bright light because at these intensities your rod signals are totally saturated and you cannot derive any signal from them. Also they don't see any color, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so the, you, you might have noticed if it's dark that the way you really, you know, if it's really dark and you don't use cone, the point of sharpest sensitivity, you, are, you know, sailors will tell you this, you know, or climbers when you climb at night or when you sail at night that you really have to look out of the corner of your eyes. Why? Well because at the fovea itself there are no, there are no, cone, uh, there are no rods, there are only cones. Right, so at the cornea, you don't really have any, under dark conditions, you don't have any signal. So, you know, you really want to make of use of the, at the, at the uh, 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 temple side or at the nasal side. That's where your peak, your peak photoreceptor distribution is. That's why you want to look at dark a little bit out of the corner of your eye. Okay. Yeah, so these are the long, medium, and short wavelengths sensitive Photoreceptor. Here what people did, Will, Williams did in, in Rochester, he used special camera, Funnels camera, to peer into the optics of two living retinas, of two living human, I think, male observers. And so these are, and then he sort of, he, you know, he added synthetic coloring. So these are, you can distinguish by the absorption, you can distinguish the three different cone receptor types. And so you can see, this is, I don't know, this is a patch, this is five arc minutes, so you know, they're 60 arc minute in a, in a degree, and you know, a degree is something like this. So it's, these are fairly small patches. And what's remarkable, these are from two different volunteers, is they, to A, they're totally different one to the other, and B, even within one, it's highly, it seems to be a highly random distribution. It's not at all like, again, if you see this in a silicon, um, in a silicon retina on a CMOS, you would have very regular, you know, you would have the three types of filtering on a very regular grid. It's nothing at all like that. It seems to be statistically, so here, three quarters of them, one are the long wavelengths, sort of conventionally called the red. Well, here only half. Here you have 20% medium. Here is 44% medium. In both cases, you have very little sh short wavelength sensitive. That's to the intensive, to the high end, the intensive. Remember, e, e equals h nu. So these are the uh, more energetic. This is uh, towards the blue. You have very little uh, blue. This was this was already known before. But what's remarkable about this, and again, it doesn't accord with our with the way we perceive the world, that things seem to be totally inhomogeneous. So even a little patch, it's not that you have a regular tiling of red, green, and blue, but you have this very uneven thing, this very uneven distribution. And somehow your brain has to compensate by, for that. Because if you look at things, something like this here, my, my nice colorful red vest, 
you know, it, if you look at just the, the red here, it looks seems to be relatively homogeneous. Or if you look at a red painting of someone, you know, if you go to, if you look at a cubist or monochromatic uh, painting, they seem to be look relatively homogeneous. You don't, you don't have the perception that you have this in, the highly inhomogeneous uh, sampling of the world. Yet that's what's present in our retina. So again, the brain has to, the brain, after the retina, not the retina, because this is what the retina sees, the brain has to compensate all of that. Now the difference between the two just is just an expression of the fact, and I think we will see that more over the next 10 or 20 years with the completion and the ever deepening of, of knowledge coming from the Human Genome Project, that each one of us, I mean we are scientists, particularly if we study animals, we always stress the commonalities with animals, and with respect to commonalities of animals, the variability among humans is tiny. Right? Compared, let's say, to shrimp that has 12 cone types, or compared, let's say, to um, male, um, male uh, New World monkeys that have two cone receptor types. Uh, you know, I mean, in fact, most mammals only have two cone receptor types. But then what you see that if you look at it in detail, I mean, that's true, but in detail there's a great deal of variability among us, and that variability will also be expressed in perception and will be studied at some point. So here clearly, I mean, to, well, to me it's reasonable clear that those individuals will not see the same, the world in exactly the same way. Because, you know, this guy has much more red. You know, if you look at, uh, yeah, this is um, long, medium, so this is green versus red. You know, the ratio here is three times uh, a third of the ratio here. You know, so my, so one, but the supposition would be that clearly this guy is going to see colors slightly different here. Not totally different, but, you know, will, this guy will probably see red very different or somewhat different than this guy will see red. And we can be begin to connect that now to the genome, right? We can begin, and people do that now, that they relate a specific aspect of perception, for example, red perception. We know that in men, there are actually two types, two different alleles here for the um, photopigment in those long wavelengths uh, cone photoreceptors. There are two slightly different alleles. There's a, di a difference in a single amino acid, and it gives rise to a shift in the spectral, in the peak of the spectral sensitivity of three nanometers. So it's roughly half half, like 55% of men versus 45% of men. In other words, roughly half of us guys here see red slightly, you know, have a slightly different photoreceptor, um, have a slightly different spectral sensitivity than the other half of, 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 of the guys. Now, and that's bound to, and, and in fact, if you do very careful tests, that, you, that, that does show up. And I think there's going to be more and more of that, that we realize that we're each born with statistically the same sensory apparatus, but in each one it really depends on genes and on, on our environment. Has, uh, have people done research on exactly how those two people, for example, see the world differently? Like on how the JW sees red as opposed to AI? Okay, so not, the, as far as I know, not this one, although I, I think that's I what... Mean, that's sort of I think that's what they want to do. Well, so as I just mentioned, they have done it with respect to these two red alleles in man. So, they, you know, you can directly test it, right? You can do PCR on a, p a little bit of blood or spit or something, and then you can see which allele do I have and which one does the next man have. And then people have tested their slight differences in, in the red, as you would expect. Um, so, yeah, so in general, it's now research. There's, for example, evidence now that women, that many women, I've seen figures up to 40%, Many women have actually four different cone photopigments. See, how does it work? Okay, we all have, so you might know, let me see. How many people are colorblind here? Is there anybody who's colorblind? I mean, there must be, statistically. Do you know which one? Are you missing the red or the? Okay, so, so if we look at the photoreceptor distribution, let me see. Um, screens center. So, okay, so this is would be the long wavelength. This is short. So this would be sort of towards red, and this would be towards blue. And I think the the rods are somewhere here. I, don't, I think, okay, I didn't include a picture here, but I think in terms of sensitivity, something like this, that the most sensitive, as I mentioned, by two orders of magnitude are the rods. And you have only a single rod type. So clearly, if you, if you don't have cones or if they're inactive because they're not sensitive enough, then you can't perceive color because you only have one type of photoreceptor. So every signal, whether it's a, you know, a, you know, whether it's a, you know, if you think of monochromatic signal, whether it has, you know, 400 nanometers or 800 nanometers, it's going to be absorbed to some extent 
depending on this curve, and the and the this this photoreceptor can only signal. There's only one way it can signal. It can only output action potential, and this action potential you don't know did it come because there was a tiny bit of monochromatic light at this uh, wavelength, or because there was a lot of light at this wavelength. Right? If you have a single photoreceptor type, you cannot tell. So that's why achromats cannot tell color, because you only have one photoreceptor. It's a very important point to remember. You only have one photoreceptor type. You cannot pick up anything differential. The only way you can, you can, so this is an instance of population response we talked about last time. The only way you can pick up color sensitivity is by comparing, let's say, this output to that output. Any one cone, any one photoreceptor by itself cannot tell you anything about color. So even if you had, let's say, only this one, again, you couldn't see color. All you would see is, is intensity. Okay, so, once again, it's very important to remember if you, you know, if you're thinking of the action potential as an electrical signal and you're looking at this neon, you know, you don't know did it just give me a signal because there was lots of this or lots of this or little of this. All you know, the neon fire. So all you know, there's some intensity there. So color you only get by differential comparison. Okay, now, so in some, in, in some, um, man, let's see, either this one or this one is missing. Because they, 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 I mean, they, I mean, they are um, uh, sex. They are on the X. They are on the sex gene. They're sex linked. So that's why you see it much more frequent in men than in women. This one seems to be present in almost all. This one is very rare to ha not to have. It's totally separate coded on a different chromosome. So either so uh, roughly, I don't know, seven or ten percent of men either miss this one or this one. Now there are two alleles of this, right? So actually, there's this one and there's this one. So and this differs by I don't know two to four or three nanometers, something like this. Now, some women express all of these cone photoreceptor pigments in different, well, at least they have the gene for it. Okay, so that's uncontroversial that some women, particular women who have colorblind sons, and I have to remember why, why that's so, but particular women who have colorblind sons uh, will, uh, will have genes for all four pigment, photopigments. If these get expressed by the retina, and if they're actually functionally wired up to the brain, that's a big if, that's not known yet. As far as I know, it's still controversial. People are doing research on it. It's still controversial. Then it's possible, then these women could discriminate colors that to their other sisters, their normal sisters with, with trichromatic vision, and all men would look identical. Right? That's, how, that's how you can test. For example, how can you test uh, um, that men are colorblind? Well, you show them two colors that to a normal person with, trichroma, with trichromacy, with, with three color vision, would look different. To a guy with only two cones, they would look identical. Right? So likewise, these women, they, w they could tell apart that, that things that look, that, that look the same to me are three color cones. It would look different to them. So, so Yeah, I have to I have to think about that. I know that's a fact. I don't know why. Right now, I have to think about it. The mother that has only three cones can have a colorblind son, but usually the woman that has four cones will not have a colorblind son. Yeah, that makes sense. Because the, the, the red cone is encoded in the X chromosome. So then, if you only have three, each one of the X chromosomes has a... Inactivated. Has a, uh, an error, and you pass that wrong gene to the son. Okay. I mean, that's how they look for them. That's also how they look for them. They advertise, and they did this first in England, they advertise women uh, who, are, who are colorblind, and they do these color tests. Although, as far as I know, the latest paper, it's still controversial. So I think what's not controversial anymore that these women exist that have genes for all four. I think what, as far as I know, continues to be unclear whether they actually express it, whether they, the brain actually makes use of this additional information. So again, well, what I find fascinating that you can, you know, that you can, um, A, it tells you a lot about specificity, right, that this tiny one base pair difference in the nucleic acids, uh, you know, in the sequence coding for this protein can, can show up in, in, in psychological measurements, in psychophysical measurements, and also that, you know, humans don't really see the world exactly the same. They see it similar, but they don't see it exactly the same. Okay. Okay, so I, I think I covered most of this. Yeah, so the important point is the third one, that, that, that so a single, that, um, 
co any individual cone will, has, will have some sensitivity, right? As I showed you this curve, I'm not going to show it again. You know, you can change monochromatic, you can have, you know, laser monochromatic light source, and you systematically change the wavelength of it, and then you find, you know, at the same intensity, there's some differential response. But that, okay, but that by itself cannot be used to compute color. The only way you can compute color if you have two or more photoreceptors, you know, that have this differential response, and then you can compare this against this. Or you can do it with three or with, um, or with four. And that's how color arises. It, it's, a, it's another instance of a population coding that's very common and very prevalent in biology. Yeah, and the other point, there's nothing sacred. There's nothing sacred about three cone, three cone types. You can show computationally that given the um, natural distribution of light sources, which typically is the sun under natural condition, and given the reflectance function of objects in the natural environment, that you capture most of the variability of, um, of uh, brightness and changes in, 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 in um, wavelength with three cones. But for, you know, it might well be that if you really care about one particular type of food, because that's really what your species eats, then you want to have additional color resolution there, and then, you know, you have additional photoreceptors. And I said some shrimps that have, you know, they have, they have total, very small retinas, but they have much more uh, color selectivity in certain, in certain frequency bands, because obviously it must be important for their survival. So in most of us, it's trichromacy, but in some, you only have, you know, you only have two, or in some cases, you have, you have sort of uh, no cone receptors, you only have rods, and in some, you have sort of cold, have some sort of supervision. What, yeah, so how, how do you test that? If you're looking, of course, at a computer monitor, you are looking, you're using your cone sig signal because it's very bright. Right, so the only way to test that is really go under very dim conditions. I mean, at night, most things look gray, right? If you really go out in the forest at night, you know, if you go hiking or climbing or anything, things look very gray. You can tell different shades of gray, and when there's moon, moonlight, then you can sort of things acquire a little bit more color. But if it's really pretty dark, you don't really see a lot of color. And, and so I think if you do see that still, it probably must be top-down effect that you know. You know, you might have some knowledge that I know my car is blue, but it sure doesn't look blue. And, and uh, I mean, it might look bluish, and I suspect that would be a top-down effect. It certainly doesn't look blue at night. Try it. But I mean, you have to be sure you are actually under hot condition. Sometimes, what I've noticed at dusk, I can sometimes see, like if I look at a garden with flowers, sometimes things look to me like I get additional color resolution, and I think what might be happening is that at that cusp, when, when there's still some light to drive the, the um, cones, but the, the light level has dropped sufficiently, so now that I get a signal out of my rod, that I then actually have four photoreceptor types that I can use, and that, that gives me additional color resolution. I, I don't know whether anybody studied that. It's just, at dusk sometimes things look very vibrant. They, they seem to acquire this additional, this additional color, and it might be possible that, that that's involved there. Yeah, so there, there's, no, so, so color is, color is, you can argue that color is already very much a derived property, that it's not an original property. What I mean, it's not a primary property. So you can say for some depth. Right, we all have depth perception. I, you know, I can estimate how long, how, you know, the distance to my hand. I can es estimate the distance to her, etc. And that's an absolute de distance, right? Two meters or whatever it is. Or motion. I can estimate, you know, so many degrees per second. It's, it's, it's an absolute. Is it moving or it's not moving with respect to me? Color. There is no such thing really as color in the world. What you have is continuous light source distribution. You got something like the sun that radiates, of course, in a huge spectrum. Okay, that's the, that reflection strikes surfaces. These surfaces will reflect, absorb light in different proportion as a function of spatial, as a function of frequency, and then that gets reflected into my into my eyes. And we as human, we then map it onto these, for most of us, three dimensions somehow. And then of course we have these names, these color names to introduce this additional level of processing. But the, uh, all of that is rather is, is to a certain extent arbitrary. And as I said, other creatures or even humans can have more or or, or less um, um, color discrimination. So, I'm, I, um, so it strikes me that color in that way is different from a lot of other things that seem to have a more objective standing, like distance and, and motion, 
or service orientation, right? You can see, you know, this is either zero or 90 degrees. It has an absolute, you know, objective orientation, but it doesn't, doesn't really have any objective color, although I would say this is black with some white, you know, chalk on it. Okay, so then there's this other thing uh, in our retina that I mentioned already, the hole. Okay, now you should just try it. You probably haven't done this since grade school, so just, just bear with me. So you, just, you should all do it. So just try it again, just to show yourself. Close one eye. Don't close both eyes. You won't see a lot. Okay, close one eye and fixate. And now, so it's, it's on the temporal side, right? Not the nasal side. It's on the temporal side, right? So on the temporal side, you know, somewhere, it's at, at the horizontal, it's horizontally, somewhere here, 10, 12, 15 degrees, the, my finger would totally disappear. I mean, the, 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 the tip of the finger. It's quite noticeable. If you move it in, you can see it. And if you move it outwards, you can see it. But there's a, like, two, three, four degrees where it just disappears. I mean, you should all just, probably haven't done it in a while. You too, Patrick. <laughs> okay, can you all see that? I mean, or can you all not see that? So, I mean, what, what I find mind-boggling, and I'm not convinced this is true, but the claim is that people didn't discover this till, you know, sometimes in the early Renaissance. I find that difficult to believe. I find difficulty that the Greeks, for example, didn't know about this. Or, but apparently there's no historical record. I mean, maybe somebody did, but there's no historical record. Even, you know, Aristotle didn't talk, it doesn't talk about it. So, so this is an indirect way of, of, of picking it up. You notice it by the absence of something, but there's not a hole there, right? That's very important. There's not a hole there. So what seems to be going on is an active interpolation mechanism. The brain actively interpolates, actively does something to fill that in. It does not just have an empty, it's not like the back of my head where I just don't see anything. Now you can check there is an interpolation mechanism. You can check, you can take for example something like a pencil. You should try that. So first of all, you, you move, this works particularly well with this pencil with this orange head on it because I can move it such that I don't see the orange anymore. There. Okay, I don't see the orange anymore. It's quite remarkable. And now what I do, but if I move a pencil across it, the pencils seem to be continuous. So if you move the pencil, so let's say the, the, the blind spot is here. If you move the pencil right over the blind spot, it's continuous. There doesn't seem to be a hole in the pencil. Okay, so... So it's a bit funny. We know you don't see anything, yet the pencil doesn't seem to end there. So what seems to be going on that the brain takes that the brain takes uh, information in the neighborhood of that from the same retina and sometimes even from the opposite eye. Of course, here we ruled it out by closing one eye. So it also has to be from the neighborhood of that, and then interpolates it, fills in. Okay, what what you could also do in principle do, and I think some people want to do that for pixel, for for cameras that have high High, um, where you have low yield and high pixel counts, one way is, is to get rid of that hole is to not to replace uh, the silicon waiver, which might be very expensive, but to actively fill in. Right? So you can say, well, if, if in the neighborhood of that pixel everything is red, then I'm just going to assume that pixel is also red, and I'm on the output of my camera, I'm going to say red. That's, the brain does something like that. It, it fills in based on property in the neighborhood. So here, what you have, you have, a nice ho you have a nice vertical edge above the blind spot and a nice vertical edge below the blind spot. So what the brain does, it paints in, it fills in this picture and says, well, probably what you have is a, is a straight edge, and that's what you tend to see. Okay, but so again, if you look at the output of the retina, the output of the retina, there's no information at that location. So this is something that the brain has to fill in. A continuous, a continuous what? And the verticals only have, you have different words in. And words. And spot, you have like some other words. So what is the brain going to interpret? Okay, so people have done experiments, not with words, because I, I don't think you have resolution out there to read, unless you make them very big. Okay. But people have done d different experiments. This guy, Ramachandran, he's written an entire Sandig American that's referred to in my article, where they do... Um, where they sort of try to investigate how clever is this interpolation mechanism. So they've done experiments like that where they manipulate things separately in the horizontal and, and, and in the vertical direction. Those experiments have been done from a psychological point of view. And, um, you know, it's, it's a limited, it, you know, it's a limited um, mechanism. It ca it's not all that smart, but it seems to work so well, <coughs> well that for 100 people, hundreds of, 
years people didn't realize that they had a hole there. It's claim it's also, there's a claim that this might also operate um, all the time, for example, um, there's this guy, Kenneth Craig, who uh, in the 30s actually volunteered, he's a psychologist at Cambridge in England, he burned a hole in his retina by looking into the sun. I mean, did this on purpose, dedicated scientist. Uh, don't do this, please. <laughs> and um, the claim is that if the, if the, the hole is very small, <clears throat> after a while, the brain uses an active interpolation mechanism to compensate for that. So this might be a mechanism that's present all the time, not just here in the, in the, for the blind spot, but it's present all the time, that if something gets damaged, at least if it's a, if it's a small hole that gets damaged, there are active mechanisms that, that try to compensate for that, which would be, of course, a fairly clever thing to do for the brain. Okay, so um, the retina, I didn't mention this because we don't talk, at, we don't dwell at all on the property of the retina, um, and there are 120, 130 million neurons. Most of the neurons signal not with these action potential, those pulses I mentioned last time, but actually signal with continuous changes in membrane potential. And it's only in, the, in this part of the, the uh, proximal retina that, that neurons change from a continuous code where events, electric, where visual events are signaled by a steady D or hyperpolarization. By the time you get to the last neuron here, these retinal ganglion cells, you have the conventional action potential. So this is an exocellular recorded signals. So by the time you get to the action potentials, well, by the time you get to retinal ganglion cells, they output an action potential. The reason is they have to travel a long distance. They have to go out of the eye into the other structures of the brain, the colliculus and cortex, etc. And that's a long distance. You want to signal information very quickly, and that's the way how the brain does it. But within the retina, when you have this relatively short distance, um, very often the brain, the, these neurons use, um, use uh, graded potentials. But now what, what people have done, you can record either by putting an electrode inside the eye or by recording from the optic nerve outside the eye. This can also be done in humans. This has been done in some human volunteers, incidentally, who are blind. In fact, what they did, they stimulated, they put electrodes in here and they stimulated this. Yes? I think the, the reason people say it's a developmental one, it has to do with the way the, the brain develops and the retina develops, it essentially develops from outside, uh, from outside to inside. So it's a, it's a developmental thing. It's not, um, it's not I, I would say, I mean, there's a main disadvantage because you surely must lose some optical quality, right? Because you have all that goo, that stuff you have to use from, and there's gonna be some absorption. Um, so, um, so I would, and I think the squid, if I'm not mistaken, the squid and octopus, Right, they, they have a direct imaging system, so they have, they have the, the, the retina, the light strikes first the photoreceptors. And I don't know whether people have ever compared sensitivity, whether they are better per unit, you know, there's somehow higher sensitivity. So no, so it's purely, it's a developmental one. I don't think there's any advantage to it. Okay, optic nerve, yep. Real quick, why were the spikes almost equal positive and negative? I don't know, maybe they're cut off. Good question. This is from an, this in fact is even from an older paper. They took it from an older paper. I don't know. Yeah, you would think, good point. I don't know. It must have something to do with the way they filtered their signal or they cut it off. Maybe it's a very low, high gain signal and they cut off most of it. And this is exocellular recorded. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the ganglion cells, I mean, I've looked at the action potential, they look principal no different than any other action potential. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, uh, this is from the Schubel book I recommended. Um, Schubel and Wiesel uh, were one of the earliest explorers of the retina, but particularly the, the cortex. So this shows you, this is based on an even earlier work by Stephen Kufflein at Harvard who sort of pioneered studying the retina in, in animals like the cat, which is really very similar organized to, to the human, to the primate retina. And what they discovered that most, many neurons, or most neurons, for example, this is a ganglion cell, uh, what these are selective to are, to first approximation, radial symmetric spots of light. So for example, on the top, it's just, if you just have black, the neuron won't respond. This is its background rate. This is, I think, 1800 millisecond. 
the stimulus here. So, you know, the neon might discharge in, this, in the dark once a second on average, something. Then you put a little spot, you flash it on here, it fires very briskly, and then sort of it settles down to somewhat more sedate discharge. You have a big spot, it fires less. Or then you put a spot, but you have an annulus, and then it's actively inhibited. And then you have a different type of cell. So this is called an on cell. It's called an on cell because if you put a little spot of light into parts of its receptive field, so now again we come back to this notion that's so critical to the, the system's neuroscience, receptive field. So here, this is where receptive fields were first defined in the retina. And they, they were defined in terms of space. So uh, you take an animal, it was first done in a horseshoe crab, but the principle is the same. You take an animal, you paralyze it, or you get it to fixate, and then you draw out where, from which part of the visual field can you, can you, get, can you excite the neurons. So you have a cat staring at this blackboard, and then you notice every time you know, you, 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 a light flashes on here, brr, brr, you, can hear the, you can hear the audio monitor. And if you do it over here, over here, over here, the neuron doesn't care. Only if you do it in this region. That's its receptive field. And so here you have an on part of the receptive field. When you flash a light in the center part of its receptive field, it likes it. Okay, when you make it uh, quite, at some point, when you make it too big, uh, the response goes down again until if you make it really big, it's, it's, it's the same as background. Okay, and then if you, uh, you can actively inhibit it by flashing light only in its surround. So if you flash light in its surround, you get this negative response. You flash it in the center, you get a positive response. And now you can imagine if you do both, then you get a sort of a linear superposition, right? So then, for example, you get this, which you can think of as that minus that, which is roughly that. And then you can ask to what extent are they linear, etc. But so here you find the classical receptive field structure early on in the, in the visual system, which is, is roughly circular. I mean, that, that neurons tend to be, um, you know, so you might have a structure like this, and then something, you know, you know things aren't perfect uh, circles here. But you have something, okay, that's not a very good rendition. I was trying to get the fact that these are not supposed to be perfect circles, but so you know you have a part of it. So if you put lights here, the neon fires, and then you have a zone around here that if you put things here, light spots here, the neon will be suppressed. And if you shine a light across everything here, then you get some excitation, some inhibition, and now it depends exactly where the balance is. So usually if you use large stimuli, the neurons don't respond all that well. If you light the entire visual field, you might get a short, quick burst response, but then the neurons uh, stop firing. This is called an on neuron. Now you have the complements called an off neuron, where you have a central region where if you shine light, it, it, it's inhibited, and then there's a surround region where if you, sh uh, sh if you shine light, it gets excited. So that's what you have here. You shine a light in the center, it gets inhibited, and then once you remove it, here you remove it, the neuron fires. Uh, and here the opposite from here, you shine this light on, you, it's dark in the center, the neon fires, remove the darkness, then the neon stops firing. Now you can think of these as rectified, you can think of this as a way for the brain to deal with negative numbers. Because how do you signal negative numbers? Right? If, you, if your code is pulses, okay? So the, if the key code to first approximation is pulses, so neon fires 10 pulses per second or 100 pulses per second, how do you signal negative numbers? Well, one way to do it is you have two classes of neurons. Okay, you halfway rectify them. Both are positive. Both signal with, with pulses. One population signals, the, you know, the positive part of the, you know, the, 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 the amplitude of the negative part, and one signals the amplitude of the positive part. And so you can think of these as, uh, as signals that, that um, on and off, that correspond to the halfway rectified positive and negative signals. And that's one way you can get around negative, um, uh, signal negative numbers. The other way to signal negative numbers uh, might be expensive. You could, of course, have a neon that fires all the time at 100 hertz, all the time, and then a negative number would be a reduction of that, right? When you go from 100 to 10 hertz, that's, that's a negative number. There, of course, that's expensive because that requires a continuous maintained discharge of 100 hertz. Some neurons do that in the Purkinje cell, but in the retina, the, uh, the way the retina seems to have chosen it in many sensory systems is to have this on and off strategy of having the positive signal carry here and the negative signal also carried by action potential in the off pathway. And the point is these things are all elongated. Yeah, what, what, what these neurons like are elongated spot, you know, spots of light, circles of light of, of various uh, dimensions. 
And one last feature before we leave the retina is that um, that if you go from the full VR, okay, so there's something called eccentricity. There's, you can define a visual angle. If you look at the retina, you can see zero, the point of origin is where the fovea is, and then you go to you, you go further away from the fovea and you define in terms of visual angle. And when you see what you can see, what you can observe, that if you look in the retina, you find the same cell type close to the fovea. Okay, this is expressed in, mil, in distance instead of degrees. You have one cell type that systematically increases in size, or you have another cell type that systematically increases in size. So you have this nice geometric progression that in the fovea you have, let's see, several cell types, and you have, they have very small, they, they have very small dendritic This is where the synapses um, provide their input, and all the electrical signals here are summed and, and are, you know, summed at the cell body. And here um, you have the threshold decision whether to find action potential or not, and that signal is then output on that optic nerve, on that axon that makes up the optic nerve that goes to the rest of the brain. And here you have the same cell type in the distal periphery; it's just larger and larger and larger. It covers larger and larger parts of the visual field. It makes sense. Of course, you, this is also how you lose resolution, right? Because here in the fovea, or close to the fovea, you have you know, one photoreceptor that maps onto one ganglion cell and that only looks at a tiny, tiny part of the visual field. So it can clearly carry a lot of information. Well, in the periphery, you have you know, maybe 50 photoreceptors that talk to, to, to this, you know, that feed all into this one neuron. So this neuron obviously will have you know, access to a much larger part of the visual field, but its resolution, of course, will be consequently much, much less than the resolution of this of, of the neuron in the in the fovea. This is from Dick Masland at um, Harvard Mass Gen in Boston, and it's a very nice picture because now we get beginning to be at the stage where we're still very far away, let's say, from in in, in cortex and thalamus where we can classify all the different types of neurons in the retina. And I won't bore you with these different descriptions. These are different, co these are cones, and these are horizontal cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, ganglion cells. So when I say ganglion cells, it's not, you know, there are 1.2 million axons of ganglion cells. These are not just one type. There are many different types. They're on and off cells. So some cells, as I showed you, only carry the on signal. Some carry the off signal. There are two big uh, additional channels of information. These are called pathways or, or channels. As I showed you before, those neurons, you have, you have at least 70% of the neurons at any given eccentricity are relatively small and seem to be specialized in carrying um, information that's related to color, to wavelength, and related to high spatial, high, high fidelity information. That's 70% of the ganglion cell. And these are called parvocellular neurons after the Latin name for where they terminate. They are, the, the cells look pretty poorly developed what they call power cell neurons. Then 10% of the ganglion cells, another Latin name, magnocellularly, they're big, well-developed. They're only 10%, so they're many fewer, and they don't carry wavelength information, and uh, they seem to specialize more in, temporal cha in change information, in temporal information. And this is a general lesson in biology, that's why I'm showing you, that you have different neurons. So these are all the output neurons. These, only these guys project outside the retina. They're axons. You know, a million of them together make up the optic nerve. But as I said, even at one eccentricity, there's not just one cell type, there are different cell types. And that's a general story, which is then replicated at each point in the visual field, that, that the brain, that all these highly specialists that, you know, for, for a job like color information or transmitting off information or transmitting um, motion information, there's a dedicated separate neuronal type that, that, and that does that. So there are, I think, 12 different, uh, 12 different cell types now what are here, what the 10, 10, 10 different uh, um, ganglion cell types. There might be more subtypes that each specialize in carrying different information. And the wonder of it all, the miracle of it all, how it all fits so well together. I mean, I get up each morning, and when I think about it, when I'm not too groggy, it, it fills, never stops filling me with amazement. Because it's not like... So this is a general lesson of the of the class, right? You, you we will we'll discover there are all these specialized networks, there are these special part of the brain. Some deals with motion, some deals with color, some deals with hearing. I mean, they're, you know, as I told you, they're networks that just do nothing but, you know, is somebody scared or is that person angry? Okay, highly dedicated networks. But it all fits together so effortlessly that I don't notice any of this, and it's taken, you know, several hundred years of science to to untangle all uh, all that circuitry. It's all integrated in this wonderful, smooth, you know. Uh, transparent interface. 
you know, talking about an interface. This is a really beautiful interface. So I don't know any of this. I'm totally, all this complexity is totally hidden from me. Because you might imagine, well, I might have to sort of scan systematically through these different channels. You can now, now I'm looking at the motion. Now I'm looking at the, the color. Now I'm looking at the stereo information. But it doesn't happen like that. It's all combined in a single interface. And that's pretty nifty. That's pretty nifty. Now if you think about it, that's... And if you, and if you ever sit in a lab, which, I mean, if you're interested in this, you should do, you listen to neurons, then you're even more mystified. Because those neurons, they look so, you know, when you hear the cackle on the loudspeaker, they look so, they sound so random to you. I mean, and out of all of that axon discharge firing has to rise all of this, um, this beautiful world. Okay, so, so, um, and the general model is here that you have specialist neurons that seem to special, that seem to specialize for different modalities. It's not absolute, but they all have sort of one specializes more in color information, the other more in motion information, and all that information is sent out in parallel. So you can think of a different, uh, from a CCD camera, you don't just have one camera coming out of the system, one pathway or channel, it's the language people and neuroscientists use, but you have maybe 10 different channels coming out. Some carrying on, some carrying off information, some carrying high, high fidelity information, some ca carrying motion information. And then there are a whole bunch of subtypes about which we know much less that go down to special parts of the brain that are sort of mainly involved in boring housekeep functions that are incredibly important for us, but they're boring. What I mean by that, for example, they're neurons that of course do nothing but control your pupil, right? You know, if you go now out in the bright sunlight, you know, your pupil takes some time to adapt. There are all the special circuitry that does, um, you know, that, that's responsible for eye movement. They're very, very sophisticated, very fancy. You, you know, you're totally oblivious of it. There's six different eye muscles. All that has to be controlled. Well, there's special neurons that do that. The neurons that involve circadian rhythm, right? The neurons in the retina, ganglion cells, it turns out, that they are selective to, um, to the overall level of, 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 of background of incident light and regulate that and influence our melatonin level, etc. These are all, in addition, specialist neurons that sort of, uh, that, that are involved in some odd little place in the brain that we don't, that computation isn't very uh, interesting, but if you're impaired, you know, can cause you a great deal of, of grief. So this shows here, this is the two retina, and so the predominant output in us, in us and in monkeys, 90%, 9 out of 10, go to this intermediate relay station called the lateral geniculate nucleus. It's part of the thalamus. The thalamus is a big structure. It's, well, big. It's maybe like a, like a quail egg, something like this, maybe an inch across. It sits pretty much in the middle of the brain. You have two of them, left, right. And these are pretty important. If you don't have your thalami, you're in big, big trouble. You're in big, I mean, you're in serious trouble, like you're in coma, okay? Uh, you don't see anything, you don't, I mean, you might be alive, but barely. So, um, and from there on, um, so thalamus, almost every modality bar one, namely olfaction, sends its, its efferent output first to a, a relay station in part of the thalamus. And the visual part of the thalamus, the one that receives the output from the retina, is called the LGN. We'll, we'll talk about that, I mean, we'll mention it a lot, LGN. And this then, in turn, projects to the back of the brain proper, to the, to the cortex, the visual cortex. So there's no direct connection from the eye to the cortex, but you go through this one intermediate relay. Although it probably does much more than a relay, but you go from the, from the retina to the LGN and then from cortex, which is not shown here. LGN, there are a number of, of things, well, we'll talk about it later. Um, and this, is, this pathway from the retina to the LGN to a visual cortex, that's the one that subserves conscious vision. So we believe, I mean, so people in general believe. Because 10% you know, of the fibers also go elsewhere. You don't really have branching. It doesn't seem to be very common. I mean, again, you could have branching. You could have one neuron that sends its output both here and to all of these other bra brain structures. In general, in the primate, that does not seem to be the case. Uh, also, there's no information that comes back into the eye. That's different. So in some animals, like um, a fish, for example, for some re weird reason, I have no idea why, there's an input from the olfactory bulb back into the retina. Okay, so the fish sees with its olfactory brain. I have no idea why, but then fish are odd. <laughs> um, uh, so in, uh, in us, uh, there's nothing that goes back from the brain. There, there are no neurons that go back from the brain back into the, back into the eye. Now, 10% of the neurons go elsewhere. So a big part of elsewhere is a structure at the top of your midbrain called the superior colliculus. And you have two of them, like almost anything. 
you have two of almost everything. Um, uh, it's called superior colliculi, both of them. And these are structures that in many animals, like birds and reptiles and amphibians, tend to do the predominant amount of heavy lifting in vision. So, so before you really have cortex, right, neocortex is really a feature of, I mean, big neocortex is really a feature of mammals. Before you had that, you always have this, um, um, the, the superior colliculus. Or the, the, name is, the other name is also sometimes called the tectum. Tectum for roof, because I guess it was sort of on top of the brain, the roof. Uh, tectum, it's another name. In, 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 in primates it's called um, colliculus. It's inferior colliculus that does, is responsible for audition. Superior colliculus is responsible for vision. And you have two of them, one on the left and the one on the right. And for us, they seem to be mainly sort of, you can think, I think of them as evolutionary older part of the brain. It's been there for a long time. And it's responsible for things like moving your eyes, controlling eye movement seems to be terrible important. So if people have lesions there, typically they have various disturbances of, of their eye movements. And then you have all these other, for example, you have the superchiasmatic nucleus, Super chiasmatic because it, this is a, a chiasm. This is a, where the brain crosses. I'll talk about that in a second. And above that, you can see very nice in structural imaging. You have um, the SCN that's responsible for circadian rhythm. So if you have disturbances of sleep-wake cycle, they tend to involve here. That's also where the clock, or the circadian clock sits. And like the, this guy gets input uh, from neurons here in the retinal ganglion cell that seem to signal something about the background level of intensity. And that's important for circadian rhythm and thing, when things go wrong, like in seasonal affective disorder. And then you have all these other minor nucleus. You know, I, I just give you their abbreviations. Like that, they are important. You don't know about them, and you know they do all these things, like moving your eyes and controlling your pupil diameter and other stuff. So I mentioned already the two dominant pathways, and not only one. So. 70% of neurons are of this type, 10% or 20% of this type, and then there are 10% that also go on to the LGN and to the uh, uh, cortex proper that do other things that are less well understood. But the two big populations are called the parvocella and the magnocella. And as I mentioned, one seems to be very sensitive to color. Uh, they have small receptor fields, small cell bodies, and they seem to signal, um, they seem to signal information about, um, about, uh, spa about small spatial details. Partly they can do that because they have small receptor field. Well, these guys don't seem to care about wavelengths. They have large receptor field, and they really respond, and the they care about uh, uh, motion information. And the number of illusions that people have developed that we'll mention later on. OK, eye movements. Do we want to talk about eye movements? How many eye movements? How, how many eye movements do you think you make a day, or a year? How often do you move your eyes? How often do you move your eyes? One time a second, ten times a second, one time an hour? <laughs> Come on, give me an order of magnitude. Trillions. Trillions. What's that? That's trillion. That's ten to the twelve. That's a little bit high. Okay, so you, you move your eyes roughly as often as you move your as your heart beats. Uh, so it's it's I mean typically you move your eyes um, two to three times a second. Now that doesn't again doesn't quite accord with our with our feeling our perception. Um, I mean even if you draw my attention to it, you know I can, okay I move my eyes now, but usually I don't think I move my eyes. But if you actually look what people do, and this is what we did here, this is done in the lab, or you this is a fractal landscape, and this is an overhead imagery of I don't know Washington D.C. And we had people just look at it, and this is the, the size of the box is how long they stayed at that location. So here they stayed a long time, then they darted around. And this you might, might have seen this before. So you know we have these eye trackers, and you can observe people now with high-speed video cameras. They constantly move their eyes all the time, and decoding that tells you a lot about people, um, what they're looking at, what they're thinking of. In fact, it's used; it can be used as a form of. Um, um, I mean, we all use it implicitly to judge people, right? we say, well, that's a shifty character because he, you know, he never looks me straight. No, we, we do that, and I think it bears some, some truth, like many of these things. You know, he never looks me straight in the eye. Uh, he's, he's shifty, you, know, you just don't trust a person like that. And of course, in some cultures, you don't look people directly in the eye because it's a threatening uh, gesture. Eye, move, eye movements are terribly important, in particular eye movements with respect to people. And you can certainly, I mean, I try this now, you can certainly observe uh, whether people, for example, tend to move their eyes to upper left or upper right, there's some influence of whether, 
you know, whether they're very emotional driven at the moment, and I think they tend to move it more towards the right, and if they're more cognitive driven, they, I mean, there are all these sort of interesting facts that you can study people. There are sort of significant asymmetries in the eye movements, and you can tell something about people by, by the way they move their eyes. Of course, if you're trained actor, you can control all of that. Um, but the fact is, and there are different types of eye movements. So the eye movements I talk about are saccades. It's a Greek term. Um, okay, I should put that in Sakad, S-A-C-C-A-D-E. So these are rapid eye movement. They can be quite big. You know, they can, you know, cover sort of 30, 40 degrees, although if they're really large, people will tend, to, in addition, to move their head. Not all, move, uh, not all animals move their eyes. For example, if you look at rats or rodents, I mean, rodents in general, they tend to move their head much more frequently than they move their eyes. Dogs are terrible expressive. You know, I have three dogs at home, and they, you know, you can, they can really sit there, and they, you can see, just like us, they sort of track you. <laughs> You know, and every time you go to the kitchen and all of that, they, they have these very expressive eye movements. And of course, we tend to associate, uh, we tend to associate uh, eye movements with, uh, with human. One reason why I think we've chosen dogs as pet, I mean, general humans like dogs because they have these expressive eye movements. Uh, then there are also other types of eye movements. They are so-called smooth pursuit, where you, you know, where you smoothly follow this thing. You don't do it with, with the saccades, you do it smoothly. In fact, uh, and this is a very different eye movement system. Require, we know quite a bit about the neural basis of this, uh, both smooth uh, pursuit versus um, saccades, and the other form of uh, other minor forms of eye movements. There are also eye movements when you try to, you know, for example, when you move in depth, you have to control, you know, your your, your both eyes simultaneously. So there are a whole set of different eye movements. Uh, most of them are most of them are, you, you have no idea you make them. And of course, if I point them out to you, you can be conscious of some types of eye movements. Um, now, um, well, what's interesting about eye movements is, well, okay, so a, what's interesting about eye movements, this seems to be a, a wonderful case, we'll talk about it later in, in, in the months, of a, of a very sophisticated system that you can show rigorously has access to information that the conscious you doesn't have access. So you can show that there's dissociation when you, if I ask you, do you see something change or not, you see, no, I didn't see a change, yet your eye movement saw it because it, it effortlessly moved your eyes to one new location. So you can have these nice um, dissociations. So Francis Crick and I call these zombie systems. It's one zombie system. So zombie system is just a general term for sensory motor agents that are highly specialized to subserving one particular type of behavior. In this case, they subserve smooth pursuit, or they, uh, they subserve uh, saccadic eye movement. And usually, the this, this system itself does not seem to generate or require consciousness to work. It works quite well in the absence of. Which is not to say that you cannot be conscious of these things, but usually you're conscious only after the fact, with a couple of hundred millisecond delay. Um, so the, the thing to say is that, I, that uh, when you stop all eye movements, image tends to fade. You can try this yourself. It's difficult, but you can try it. So um, today our magnet, uh, yesterday our magnet arrived, uh, magnetic scanner here. And so within a month, we are, we are going to look for volunteers to get your brain scanned. And then, because making even small eye movements, we're going to ask you to have a, a bite bar, so you'll get a, a, pl a plastic um, something uh, which we mold up to your teeth to, to prevent uh, movement of your head. But to further minimize uh, movement, because we really want to optimize the signal to noise, we ask you no, uh, to minimize eye movements. And then what you, when you really try to fixate something, when you really try not to move, when you think, you get, very often you get this, gray, this fade out, everything turns gray, and what you've got to do, you, you have to do this in order to restore vision. You can also do this artificially. So this you can try yourself. You, it's a little, it takes practice, but you can try it, not to move your eyes at all, and after a while, everything becomes gray. And you can also do this using electronic feedback that I measure at high speed, let's say at a you know, couple of hundred hertz, where your eye is. I position an, a picture on your retina, and now when you move, I sense that and immediately shift the picture at, at high speed, so the picture always stays at the same location, then also very quickly you get uh, the image fades, you get this fading. And fading is not only a retinal phenomenon, it's an interesting, que interesting question because it could be used as a strategy to study consciousness because you can ask where does the fading take place, is it a retinal phenomenon or is it a cortical phenomenon, it's probably both, and you have access, does the brain have access to information that you consciously don't see, yet some other agent in, the, in your brain still makes use of that? Those are all interesting research questions. Okay, let me uh, show you a movie. So one interesting thing about, well, there are lots of fascinating information about eye movements. One is that you cannot see your own eye movements. And so it's another case of a dissociation between what you see and what's out there. So when you look at me, you can clearly see my eyes move, right? 
So it's not that I'm, I, my eyes move so fast that you can't see them. So, you know, I, mo I might move my eyes at 3, 4, 5, 6, if I really try and I'm young and all of that, I can maybe move them at 600 degrees per second, but you can still see that. You cannot see your own eyes move. So you should try that when you go back to your bathroom. Just do this. Look in the bathroom mirror and, and you know, look from here to here and here. You'll not see, and you'll not see your eyes move. What you'll see, you'll see your eyes at the beginning of it. You'll see your eyes at the end, but you will not see the transition. So what happens is that there's, there's a process called saccadic suppression. Okay, saccadic, I move in suppression. And it's a, it consists of a very different component, masking, all of that. I don't want to go into it. But the fact is, you don't see your eyes move during that time, yet you don't have black. It's not that you see something, there's a black, you know, a blackout, and then you see something again. But again, it's another interpolation mechanism where the brain fills in. So it's like a dynamic, you know, it, it's like a movie. You're missing, let's see, 80 milliseconds because that's you moved your eyes. And so the brain cleverly interpolates. It takes something from the beginning when you fixate. It, it takes something from the end and it interpolates that. And it look and then sort of it it splices that into the movie of your life. When I unfocus my eyes, when I'm looking in the mirror, I can watch one eye rotate away as long as I focus on. One you can see one eye rotate. <laughs> if I unfocus my eyes, so like right now I can see two. If I do that while looking in the mirror, as long as I pay attention to either the left or the right eye, it doesn't matter which, I can watch the other eyeball rotate away. Huh. <laughs> Never heard of that. That's, no, huh, yeah. that's interesting. I think so. Uh, huh. I can do it with both eyes. Huh. <laughs> but it only works when you de when you deep focus? Yeah. Like, you know how you can deep focus? Yeah. yeah. So I have one eye holds still, and then I, I can watch the other eye still be turned away. Wait, so you can control your eyes independently? You can do that regularly? I mean, you can... <laughs> Gosh, okay. <laughs> can we use you as subject? <laughs> huh. Okay. And most of us can't. I mean, most of us, our eyes are, are always yoked. I mean, I, I, I have no idea how I could move my eyes independently. I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so it's, it, the saccadic suppression is an interesting phenomenon because, again, it suggests there's this disconnect between what's out there. As I said, as I said before, we all have at heart these naive realists. We think what we see is really that's how the world is. But it turns out, you know, even just in the last two lectures, I think I've given you a whole range of phenomena where what we see is not really what's out there. So we, what we should see, we should see a movie, the A that's interrupted. Well, if we move our eyes and we see continuously, it's, you know, if you take a video camera, you continuously do this. Now that's going to, you know, your viewers won't stand for it. They'll throw up, right? So it's the first thing you have to learn once you buy a video camera is to move very slowly because people hate this. Yet our eyes do it all the time, right? We do it all the time. We move it, you know, three times a second. So... That's probably one reason why people think you have this saccadic suppression is that um, it tends to, um, um, when the image is blurred in any case, so you would lose high fidelity information, high spatial frequency information due to the blur, you, 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 you shut down. The mechanisms are being sort of heavily debated right, um, right now. But it is a clear case when, when your visual system is partly shut down, yet it doesn't look that way subjectively. So there has to be another mechanism that compensates for that. So I'll show you a movie that uh, Laurent Etier, a uh, CNS student, used to be in the lab, did. To make this point, this finishes the first lecture, and then I'll just briefly, well, no, we'll just finish, I guess, today. Um, um, the movie that makes a point that while the retina is important for seeing, that, of course, visual information has to be, has to be generated, you know, at the photoreceptor level. You have to translate photopic, in, I mean, uh, phot photons into electrical signal. And that's all necessary for seeing the nature of the electrical activity or the neural activity in the retina does not correspond to visual perception. So A, there's this dramatic decrease in spatial acuity, although the world looks sort of, when I look at it, I, it doesn't look blurred. It looks sharp everywhere. Uh, provable, I know it's sharp here and it's less sharp out there, but it doesn't look that way. You only, oh yeah, I, I failed to mention. So in general, you have three, so you, where you have cones, you tend to have three cones not equally distributed, the short wave cones, the blue ones, always tend to be in a minority. You always have many more of the long and the medium range ones. 
Furthermore, at the point of very sharp seeing the central half degree, so that's maybe like this, you only have long and medium wavelengths. You don't have any short wavelengths. The argument is it's an evolutionary one. It's difficult to really prove rigorously that you don't have that because you want to minimize chromatic aberration. Right? You get chromatic aberration, and of course the chromatic aberration is stronger the higher the, the, the higher the frequency of the light. And so with blue, you would get the maximum chromatic aberration. And, um, and so the, the brain wanted to avoid that. This is how the story goes. The brain wanted to avoid that, and therefore at the, at the central part of the fovea, you only have two photoreceptor types. Uh, I mean, that's an anatomical fact, and you, you can show that psychophysically that it is true that in the central part you only have access to, uh, to uh, red and, quote, red and, quote, uh, green photoreceptor signals. Yet again, I, I don't see that. You know, if I, look at the blue, if I look at something blue like the screen here, right, it doesn't look like when I really focus at the center that, I don't, that there's a hole there, that something looks yellow. <laughs> then you have the blind spot where you don't have any information, direct information. Then uh, you constantly move your eyes, and if you, do, if you just try to mimic this, as you'll see in the movie, you, you, know, you, you get this horribly, horrible blurred signal. And furthermore, something I haven't mentioned at all yet, you also blink. You blink like not quite as often as you move your eyes, you blink two or three times a second, partly to lubricate. Of course, you can also do it voluntarily. That has a different dynamic. So partly you do that to keep the eye wet and lubricate. Partly, you know, when you have dust, when there's dust or something, to clear that. Partly it also seems to reflect a certain autonomic state. I mean, when people are very nervous, something they might also blink. But uh, again, that doesn't really make, you know, until I pointed this out to you, I'm not sure when's the last time you thought, when you actually constantly knew you made a blink. Probably many years ago. Yet you do them, you know, two or three times a minute. So let me show you this movie. So it's a simulation. It's now a few years old. So first he scanned using a different si signal. Laurent scanned. So this is uh, uh, what a person would do looking at a looking at the um, <laughs> looking at the uh, at this image. And now this is here. so the point of sharpest seeing is always here. The, fo the blind spot is always here. Here at the point of sharpest seeing, that's why you see this funny color. You have no blue sampling, and of course it falls off. Okay, so that's how the output of this image would be mimicking something about the... the this is in, in, in real time. Okay, now you'll agree with me that vision doesn't really look like that. Now, of course, it's a computer simulation and all of that, but, but I mean, it's trying to get... It's trying to get this... I think it just loops now. Um, and here you're sitting actively on the car. Here you're sitting on the optic nerve, as it were. That's why, with respect to you, the we can look at once more. With respect to you, the uh, blind spot doesn't change, and the point at the center where you don't have blue photoreceptors doesn't change. And of course, you see the complement of blue, which is uh, which is yellow. Uh, this is what it, what the odd, the external observer views. And now, in a second, you'll see what the the eye would see. This is first, I mean, at slow speed. Of course, here we didn't bother to model the, the edge of the visual field, right? That's why you see the edges. Okay, and let's finish with that. So th this is just a, a, to underlie the message you don't see with your eyes. <laughs> 